Good afternoon, and welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinar Series, our premier digital educational platform featuring a variety of interactive programs to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when and where your team needs it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director of Events here at NCIA, and as always, I'm very excited to welcome you all to the first 2021 edition of our ongoing NCIA Committee Insight Series today, being hosted by our Risk Management and Insurance Committee. If you're just joining us, please stay on the lookout for housekeeping and orientation instructions to be relayed via the chat window from here on out, so we're not taking up any more valuable time with routine info. But if you do have any questions on how to participate in today's virtual event, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or my colleague, Brooke Gilbert, at any time via a private message inside the chat room. And finally, before we get started, a thank you and final note to our guests who are joining us for the limited preview on our Facebook live stream. If you're an active NCIA member, follow that short link in our description to log into your account and join the conversation. If you're not an NCIA member, follow the Join Now link to activate your membership or the Register Now link to purchase a discounted pass so you don't miss out on this invaluable programming. Now, let's get this show on the road. Today's in session entitled New States Licensing Framework and Insurance Requirement will focus on new state medicinal cannabis programs, expanding adult use programs, and the insurance requirements that are a part of the licensing process. Panelists will review most common requirements for licensed hopefuls, deep dive into SOPs and best practices, and establish key pillars for a sound, scalable risk management program. I know our audience is eager to dive into this information, so let's not waste any more time. To kick things off, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's session to the virtual stage, Eric Ron, Managing Director of Ron and Associates Insurance Brokerage. Hi, Eric, nice to see you again, as always. Well, before we get started, why don't I let the audience know a little bit more about your own background and expertise before you introduce the panelists in turn to do the same. Eric is a highly specialized insurance broker and risk management professional with over 30 years of experience providing tailor-made, hard-to-place insurance coverage to domestic and multinational public and private corporations. Uh, Eric has studied or held several executive positions in highly regulated industries, including maritime and casino gaming, prior to starting his own firm and leverages his extensive knowledge of corporate business practices to provide C-suite executives critical risk management strategies that fully protect and safeguard themselves and their business. Well, I think we've prepped the audience with everything they need to know before getting started. So why don't you take it away from here, Eric, and uh, get started with today's program. Thank you, Brian. Good, good afternoon and welcome to the NCI webinar series. Today we'll be discussing new states licensing framework and insurance requirements from a panel of bright and knowledgeable and experienced cannabis insurance and accounting experts. I'll be your moderator today and guide you through the challenges of operating a business in a highly regulated cannabis industry. Our hope is you will take away some valuable information and some knowledge of how to start, organize, and regulate your cannabis risk management policies and procedures. What is enterprise risk management? What's your game plan? How do you risk, how do you rate your risk when it comes to natural hazards, financial risk, strategic risk in your supply chain, or an operational risk? Over the next hour, we're going to be doing a deep dive from a 3,000 foot view all the way down to getting down into the weeds on how to put a risk management program together. So with that, with no further ado, I think we're gonna discuss how we look at a regulated industry. And we're gonna start with the biggest changes coming in 2021 from Matt Johnson, he's gonna join us and talk to us about the new states that are coming online for cannabis. Matt? Hey, Eric. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yes, like Eric said, we're going to start with that high level view of some changes in the, the cannabis industry and how to be prepared for how they're going to uh, impact the American cannabis industry for years to come. Uh, before that, a, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Matt Johnson. I work for Quad Score Insurance Services. 
Uh, we work with expert cannabis insurance brokers like Eric and Jeffrey and, and Michael on this call to provide property and casualty insurance solutions to licensed cannabis operators around the country. Uh, moving on a, a bit from that, uh, we had some very exciting news towards the end of 2020 after a, a particularly tough year for everybody. Uh, with five states voting to legalize medical or adult use marijuana uh, in, in varying capacities. Uh, we had Arizona, New Jersey, Montana, South Dakota, and Mississippi uh, all vote uh, in, in favor of cannabis, which kind of shows that the people really want this green wave to continue riding across America. Um, I believe those five states are projected to add about a billion and a half dollars of revenue to what is already a $20 billion marketplace in the United States over the coming year. Uh, as this industry continues to grow, it is of paramount importance that you have a risk management plan in place to protect your assets from fire, theft, lightning, and all the other unexpected, uh, unpleasant things that, that await us in the real world. Uh, additionally, it, it's worth noting that uh, for the, the first time in a while, we have a blue House of Representatives, a blue Senate, and a blue White House, which means that uh, prospects for federal reform of the, the cannabis industry are at a, a new high. Um, with that in mind, there are really three paths that uh, the cannabis industry could take uh, towards legalization. The first being uh, full-on federal legalization which would make the American cannabis industry regulated by the federal government, uh, take some of the issues out of the, the hands of the states and allow for endless trade opportunities, uh, you know, both interstate commerce and international commerce with shipping to countries like Spain and Canada and uh, Mexico is coming online. So tremendous potential there. Uh, unfortunately, that is the least likely uh, option for uh, federal cannabis reform. Uh, with it, the, the major impact that might provide on the cannabis industry would be to allow for the uh, play of admitted uh, standard cannabis markets. Think your, your GEICO, your farmer's insurance, uh, country financial, all those you know, kind of household insurance names. We're currently a, a bit worried about joining the, uh, the industry and providing risk solutions uh, due to the financial hazard that it uh, you know, imposes on their operations to participate in what is still a, a federally illegal industry. Uh, with that in mind, the, the next two options uh, to move forward here to, to some degree are decriminalization um, and either D de or, or rescheduling of cannabis. Uh, decriminalization effectively would encourage the existing state by state framework that we've seen emerge throughout the United States uh, and removes any, any criminal penalties uh, would likely allow for the Safe Banking Act to pass through and, and still assuage some of the fears of the large uh, insurance companies looking to, to get into the space uh, by providing them security in their, their banking. Uh, so to some degree, there's a, a lesser potential for the standard markets to come in and provide insurance solutions for cannabis operators. Uh, moving on from that, what appears to be the most likely is either descheduling or rescheduling of cannabis as a Schedule One controlled substance. Uh, descheduling would completely remove it from the federal uh, controlled substances registry, uh, which is something akin to de decriminalization. Uh, rescheduling, however, is where the progress is already being made with the introduction of the Marijuana One to Three Act. Oh, it, Matt, sorry to interrupt, but it looks like we lost your audio feed. Oh, I'm not sure if he's able to hear us. Let me send a quick chat message. We do see him. some oh. progress happening, at least on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, we're certainly optimistic that federal legalization is uh, only a, a few years around the corner. Uh, with that in mind, the, the five states that legalized cannabis and the end of 2020 had put some pressure on other states around the nation, uh, states like New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, even some of the more conservative southern states, uh, like where I live in Georgia, we've got the uh, Georgia Access to Medical Cannabis Commission currently accepting cultivation licenses for medical cannabis cultivators. Uh, beyond that, you know, Florida has a booming medical program 
uh, and has a, a significant potential to go recreational or adult use in the, the coming years. Um, so a lot of optimism here. We're going to see continued growth in this industry. We're going to see that $20 billion of legal cannabis uh, industry growing into a 55 or, or $60 billion industry uh, over the next you know, decade or, or 20 years. Uh, so a lot of excitement and optimism here. But again, it, it is uh, very important that cannabis businesses have a good plan in place to protect their assets moving forward and be prepared for the unexpected. Thanks, Matt. Just a kind of a quick question for you. Um, Eric, I think we might have you on mute. No, no we heard you, here. Eric. I, I think that Matt might be having an issue with his audio output on his end. So I will try and give him a call on the back end maybe, but I would say if you well, have another be a question, pandemic video call, correct. if we didn't have some technical difficulties. Uh, Matt, can you hear me? Let's do you this. guys still hear me? I'm getting messages in the chat. I'll, I'll come back to Matt in a, at, towards the end with some wrap up questions for him. In the meantime, we're going to continue to move down our agenda and we're going to introduce Simone Kassen. Did I say that right? Simone Kassen, yes, that's Sorry. correct. How are you, Eric? I'm just fine and, and thanks for joining us today. Simone, can you give us some insight of what the states are looking for from startup companies who are trying to ensure their companies going forward once they get licensed? What, what are the common and basic policies that people can use to transfer risk to traditional insurance products? Cool. So thank you so much for having me. I'm Simone Kaysan, um, owner of Canis Capital, which is an insurance agency where um, and we do everything from seed to sell and everything in between. So that's a wonderful question. And um, I, I, one thing that I want to start off with, I want to explain that as startup companies go to um, to get their insurance and even as existing companies go in to renew their insurance, there's going to be three buckets that you really want to kind of consider. The first of which is going to be what your state requires. And so every state has a requirement of insurance, whatever that it is. And that's going to be needed for you to be able to move through to get your last final stage of licensing. But in addition to that, there's also your municipalities in most states have the, um, have the authority to be able to be even tighter or even stricter on those requirements also. And then last but not least, which is really, really important, things that are unique um, protection or per perils or hazards being protected that are unique to your business model. So all three of those things are going to be really, really important. One of the things that makes this team so cool is that we understand that no insurance policy is uh, the same. So it's like a snowflake. Everything should be different. Every policy and package should be different. But there are some pillars that you're going to probably need and that kind of are universal in every state. So I'm going to jump right in. So the first thing is general liability. So general liability, just about every single state is going to require for um, cannabis companies to have $1 million or more of general liability. And that general liability is just business insurance. And it's going to, um, it's going to protect your business um, for the cost of maybe property damage claims, um, medical expenses that may occur from um, an injury in the company, uh, court costs, just general coverage is going to be needed. And that's universal. The next one is going to be product and complete operation. Now, let me explain something to everyone. Um, cannabis is a consumable product, right? And although every state or most states has some form of seed to sale tracking, if something were to happen during consumption, the client, the patient, or the customer, the person, the entity that they actually target 
is going to be whoever they got it from. So if you are a retail space, making sure that you have product liability or the vendors that you're utilizing offer some type of product liability. In addition to that, making sure that your operation as a whole, if you're a grower or a manufacturer, that it has some form of coverage. Again, most places, we, we um, most states use some form of um, uh, seed to sale tracking. And although that's great and we can always find Find out where it is, but still making sure that you're protected in the event that a lawsuit or something happens. Okay. The next one is going to be property. Yes. So we are seeing a harden in real estate, right? So if you are in most of um, the states have um, and municipalities have what we call cannabis zones. Right. So there are places it's like the red light district for cannabis. You can go in and they have these zones. Well, in addition to that, um, what we want to make sure is that that property is being covered. So legal expenses, anything that's going on for that, if there's any um, damages or liability coverages, we want to make sure that that property is being covered. The next one is going to be crime and fidelity. So we are dealing with a high commodity. And what does crime and fidelity protect you on? Usually it protects if maybe an employee or someone does something that they didn't have any business doing, some type of fraudulent behavior or whatever. So crime protection is really, really important. One of the things that we also get a chance to see when we go to different properties, um, I know when I go and I check out like different growers or whatever, if they have more of a meticulous or maze type of way of, of, um, of getting in and out of the facilities, those can always help with um, the premiums that you're purchasing. So in essence, the harder you make it for them to steal, the better it is for your premium, the better it is for you. So making sure that we're able to put in those things and, and having for crime and fidelity. Um, in addition to that, some of your municipalities may ask you to have an even higher financial coverage, meaning that maybe your coverage in a municipality may ask for you to have a financial responsibility of an additional $20,000 on top of everything else that you have. Sometimes those can be covered through what we consider surety bonds. And those bonds are able, ways for you to be able to um, uh, uh, provide financial responsibility and use a surety bond or insurance product instead of having to put in and self-insure or self-financial responsibility with the $20,000 put into an escrow account. So that's another opportunity. Next one, we're almost finished, delivery. Now, this is, we have tons and tons of transport businesses, right? And so even in Massachusetts, they even have a license to be a transporter. But more and more since we've had COVID, of course, more and more um, dispensaries are leveraging and utilizing delivery, right? So it's the new normal. So with that, you have to have a commercial auto insurance. And that insurance is going to protect, um, protect, the, it'll protect the vehicle it's going to be able to protect the drivers, but all these things that you need to have protection from. So most of just about every dispensary that are retail that I've recently insured, they have offered some form of protection, um, delivery service, and so that's being protected. The last but not least that is a pillar is going to be workman's compensation. Now, most of your states are going to make it mandatory that you have workman's compensation. And workman's compensation is simply a coverage that's going to be for your employees if they are hurt or injured during, um, during their employment with you. Now, big question that I keep getting. Does it cover over COVID? No, it doesn't. So now as of now, no um, workman's comp comes from an injury, right? So, or, or a medical disease, that's a definite result. Although we have exposure, we have yet to see any insurance company pay out a claim due to COVID-19. That's it. What a great presentation. Simone, I got a question for you. What is it? <laughs> Why is cannabis insurance its own subsection from other insurance products? Is it because 
each state's different. It is each policy have different language. Can you kind of give us a little insight as to the nuance of maybe some of the exclusions or exceptions that we find in cannabis? Well, you know what? Okay, so I'm gonna be honest with you. First of all, they're not as cool as us, right? So that's the first reason. They're not as cool as us. But um, insurance companies are really kind of built on a couple of different practices. Either they have stockholders or even their policy hold, um, policy members can be holders. And in a nutshell, really, because it's still federally illegal, nobody really wants to get into this whole game. The risk tolerance isn't there. They don't want to answer to the people. Um, and they just really don't want to say, oh, okay, we're in the cannabis industry. And there might be waiting on it to become federally legal. That's the first thing. So that's the why they didn't. Let's let me let's talk about why we're glad that they don't, right? So the difference between all of us is that we sell insurance, but we're cannabis professionals, meaning that we understand the business model. We understand how things work. We can create these protection packages that are great, that are a reflection of how cannabis businesses do business. Instead of just having a, a, a cookie cutter product that doesn't really um, target the unique risk for the cannabis. So let's let's be honest. I'm really kind of glad all state isn't here. You know, we're really kind of glad that there's us that's here instead of. But the reason why they're not is because they shouldn't be in their skin. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. And they're not as cool as us. That's, that's, that's for sure. Thanks. Yeah, that's it. So Matt, I'm going to come back to you and we with a quick question. Um, since insurance since cannabis is state regulated and it's each state has their own set of regulations, let's say I'm an, an MSO, a multi-state operator. Do I need to write a policy for each state that I am or is, do certain carriers offer multi-state packages? Well, Eric, I'm, I'm glad you asked. That has been a, a problem in the cannabis industry. You'll see uh, a large multi-state operator in a dozen states, and they've got a dozen different policies to cover their business in each of those states. And it, it can be a real pain uh, not to just deal with one insurance renewal, but you know, 10 or 12 or 15. Um, Quad Score has a, a unique solution to that problem where we have no issue writing a commercial package policy across state lines uh, to protect the financial interests of those multi-state operators. Uh, not sure quad score can boast being quite as cool as Simon in that regard, but I, I think it's a pretty neat feature uh, and certainly one that's helped us remove a, a lot of headaches for these large MSOs uh, with very expansive businesses. Very good. I think Simone was saying, you know, the producers, brokers, and agents are the cool people. Uh, the insurance guys like you are cool because you're really interested in looking at cannabis and looking outside the, the traditional insurance market. So with that being said, I'm going to transition into our next speaker, Jeff Samuels. And uh, how do, and he's going to talk about how do these requirements impact and integrate into the application process and how you can leverage your insurance to improve your application. And I think that's a key Component when you're making your application that state regulators like to look at. They like to know that one, you got a compliance and risk management uh, strategy. Preferably, you have a compliance and risk management individual within your company. But with that being said, I'm going to let Jeff take the reins and uh, talk to us about this important topic. Cool. Uh, thank you, Eric. And Simone, thank you. That was the energy we needed. So thank you. That was awesome. Um, my name is Jeff Samuels. I'm the vice president of the cannabis practice at Embroker. Embroker is an insure tech uh, based in San Francisco, but uh, across the country. Uh, and the goal there is to create efficiencies in the insurance process using technology to do so. Uh, and I'm very proud. I've been uh, part of NCIA uh, for quite a while and, and been in the business six years. Um, so I've had a, a bunch of different experiences kind of just looking at how we leverage, uh, obviously, insurance uh, and integrate that in, into different ways. Um, and it, it especially exciting, you know, being a, a New York City guy, uh, but just primarily th this group is, is uh, heavily East Coast favored. 
um, and looking at kind of the new states coming on. So looking at New Jersey adult use, looking at the success in Massachusetts and Florida, it's really exciting. And I think that the question, Eric, is when a state's coming on, do they have a program already in place or is this kind of a new application? Um, and I think a, a lot of this conversation and topic is, is for new startups. Uh, MSO is a little bit different because they're probably coming in and acquiring licenses. Still important for them to always uh, obviously know and, and comply with, with uh, regulations in the state, the insurance regulations that Simone touched on. Uh, but lo looking at the lens of we're applying for a brand new program in a, in a new state um, and, and how companies can kind of leverage insurance to not only make the application a little bit stronger, but really just have a more concise uh, risk management and, and security program. Um, and so for me, you know, I think looking at uh, some experience I had working in New Jersey on the app, uh, the medical application in 18 and 19 um, with, with one of my clients, um, we realized that um, although these states are requiring insurance once you're licensed, um, there were kind of differences between each state and each market if they're even looking for that in the application process. And so I, I think we should look at this as an opportunity to, um, you know, integrate some, some risk management, even when it's not required. Um, and so looking at a, a state application and kind of understanding, you know, what, what they're going through and what they're looking for, um, there's always going to be a, a security section in there, which I think is, is the perfect place to kind of integrate your insurance plans and talk about risk management. Um, and something that I've done with, with my clients that I think can be helpful for, for many people and especially new startups coming into new states, um, my, my recommendation would be to look at an insurance application. So if you're coming into to New Jersey and you're applying for the next uh, adult use round, for example, we know their insurance requirements, um, but they, they might not be required to be purchased before you have a license. If you're able to seek out um, an insurance partner while you're building the, the business model, I think it provides a lot of benefit to the company. Uh, and so first off, you know, answering the application will give you details of how do insurance underwriters like you know, Matt's team at QuadScore look at and assess risk. So before you're even licensed, you're, you're understanding what is the process to get insurance? What are companies like you know, QuadScore and others who, who underwrite in the business looking for as they underwrite a new entity? And so taking that process, um, not only do I think uh, there, there's value teaching this, this new startup, but I think you can use some of those application uh, that, you know, again, a QuadScore or any, any other market application quest questions into your state cannabis application. Um, so asking, you know, what are the security features in the building? What are the risk controls from employee handbooks or employee training? All of this stuff is critical to a risk management program. And if you're awarded the license, you're going to need it anyway. So I think going through a formal application will give, um, again, new, new uh, hope, uh, license hopefuls information needed that will eventually be helpful once they win that license. Um, another thing that, that I think you know, looking at that app application and applying before you have the license, it will give you a, a price point. Um, that way you can integrate that line item. So if you know it's gonna be a $50,000 cost or a $10,000 cost, whatever the cost is for the year, you can put that into your budget. And when you know the regulators are reading your application, all this makes sense and it, and it flows in a cohesive manner. So you can see that you've planned for security, you've planned for insurance and risk management once you have that license. Um, and so, you know, what, what has been successful for my clients is going through that application, applying, and maybe we, we even go through and, and get that quote. Like I said, you, you'll now know the price. Um, and looking in the future and being optimistic, once you win the application, then you have a, a quote that you can execute on and you've already done the work. And I think it's also a, a huge benefit because you've already established a relationship with your broker. Um, so not only have you done your homework up front, your quotes ready to execute, you know, being confident that you're going to win that new license, but you have your risk management partner kind of, you know, ready to go. Um, and the, the next section and, and kind of the uh, parting piece that I think is, is important 
I've used it. I think other producers can and, and should use it to just support the industry a little bit better. Um, not always required. I think Massachusetts, some of my clients have used this, but um, once people go through the application process, we send it in, we get a firm quote and we say, this is bindable once you're, you win your license, um, we're able to produce a letter of insurability, basically saying, you know, Simone's dispensary in, in New Jersey uh, is an insurable business. And we believe once they win the license, we'll be able to provide them insurance. Uh, so again, just taking that a step further, showing you're prepared, showing that you, you studied and, and you did your homework and you know the state's requirements around insurance. Um, and last but not least, you know, if your application like New Jersey, for example, did not necessarily have a section for insurance, we felt like piggybacking off of uh, the security section was a perfect place to put it and put a nice end cap on how you're thinking, again, insurance, risk management, security, and just showing that you're prepared and that you've taken the necessary steps um, you know, to, to look into insurance and plan once you do win that license. Um, so th those are kind of my tips and, and how I think the applications can, can be um, a bit of preparedness and, and just use that to your benefit as you're developing your business and, and your insurance plans. Thanks, Jeff. So I got a couple of quick questions. <clears throat> you know, we, we spend time in developing business plans and financial models. And, you know, even before we even bring in first investor dollars, can you explain to us what are some of the key metrics as a, as a potential cannabis company I should really know when I make that first phone call to my broker? Yeah, that's a great question, Eric. Um, so I think, you know, especially looking at general liability, product liability, property. So look, let's look at GL and, and product liability first, which is, you know, if you're in this business, if you're a license holder, you need product liability, uh, as, as Simone said. Um, you know, the big cost driver there is going to be your projected revenue. So, you know, if you're quoting with, with, with Matt's team over at Quad Score and, you know, you're a brand new business, I like to coach my clients, you know, give a conservative estimate. Uh, it's not necessarily the number that you're pitching to investors. If you're going to do a hundred million in your first year, this is kind of what you think is attainable uh, and, and what you think is reasonable. And that number is going to drive your cost for product liability. So projected sales is, is critical. Um, you know, on, on the property piece, again, you know, most likely going to be required by your state. You need to have an idea of kind of insurable value. So what, what are the value of your real estate assets, whether you own them or you lease them? What's the value of your equipment, your inventory? Um, and then I think kind of the last component of that is, is from a business interruption standpoint. So thinking about, you know, if your business is not operational, you know, what, what is that, that cost and what is that, um, you know, value look like to the business. Um, so, so property, general liability products, I think all critical, but projected sales, know the value of, of your, your assets. Um, and then the, you know, I think the rest of this stuff can be filled, filled in, but the, those, those are the critical ones. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate that information. So moving further down into the weeds, we're going to talk about uh, what happens once you are awarded your license in any particular state and what happens now, now that you're lucky enough to get the Willy Wonka chocolate bar, uh, Matt Denault still digging himself out of snow up there in Massachusetts is going to give us a little insight to what happens next. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, Michael Denault here with Charles River Insurance. Um, yeah, we're based uh, about an hour outside of Boston. We have about three feet of snow total on the ground. So definitely spent the last couple of days digging myself out. Um, so really great topic today. Thanks to everybody that's you know joining in on the, uh, the attendees board and obviously the rest of my panelists here. Simone, I don't think anybody can match your energy, but we'll do our best here. Um, so, you know, you're, you're awarded your license now, what happens when it comes to insurance and your coverage? Um, you know, honestly, I'm gonna piggyback off of what Simone did with the different types of coverage and the different breakdowns here. So general liability, I mean, it is what it is. It's your premises liability, your advertisement uh, liability, um, pretty standard limits, 1 million, 2 million, you're good to go. Um, and then you get into the products coverage. Um, 
like Simone said, that's going to be for retail facilities or any type of manufacturer or cultivator. Um, the only thing that, you know, you can add on after the fact, once you get your license would be a piece of coverage called product recall coverage. Um, this is for, if you have a batch of product that goes out, it tests poorly. Um, you know, there's mold mildew or it gets somebody sick from it. Um, you know, that batch needs to get rid of, you need to get rid of it. Um, whether it's already at the retail facility, um, you know, that coverage is going to protect your, um, your overhead costs for that load. Um, when you move down to the property section for your, uh, uh, your, your, your policy breakdown, you know, you have your building coverage. That's pretty standard when you go and you get your lease or you, you get financed by the bank. Um, a couple of pieces that you may want to add on after the fact, once you're up and running, um, you're going to want to insure your equipment. Um, a lot of equipment manufacturers, if you lease your products, they will come with um, warranties. Um, sometimes that's not enough. Uh, equipment coverage is pretty vital. If something was to break down due to a covered loss, if there was a leak in your ceiling, if there was some sort of a fire, um, something like that, um, you're going to want that equipment coverage on there. BPP, that's business personal property. That's going to be covering your desks, your chairs, your computers, um, things that are in your office. I mean, if you're a, if you're a cultivator, um, your business personal property may not have anything to do with your growing. Um, that's the stuff that you may not even think about. Um, those costs add up pretty quick. You're going to want to have those added on as soon as you, you get the green light from your state. Um, another piece of coverage for the property section would be crop coverage. Uh, that's something that not a lot of people think about or think is available to the market right now. Um, ensuring your crop is an indoor cultivator um, and even some outdoor hemp cultivators uh, is available. Um, that is something that you're going to want as soon as you start growing, um, you know, the plants themselves, they can get pretty expensive. I mean, mother plants, uh, as soon as they're ready to go, ready to get trimmed and harvested, um, or if you're making clones off of them can go for 800 bucks a piece. Uh, you're going to want to have some coverage on there. Um, moving forward from there, Simone touched on the automotive piece. Um, Another thing to go with that, especially here in Massachusetts, there's a lot of home delivery licenses being uh, sent out and businesses are starting to get going. Um, you have your auto insurance to cover your liability and your uh, property damage, but what about the product itself? You're gonna wanna have cargo coverage. So that's another piece that you wanna have added on to your property section there, uh, especially if you have a retail component of your business or if you're strictly a, a, um, a transportation company. Um, I did see a question uh, in the Q&A section about cyber. Absolutely. Uh, in this day and age, 2021, you want cyber coverage. Almost everything we do is online. Here we are. We're online. Um, some of the biggest pieces uh, about cyber coverage, if you have a, a cloud-based server just having all of your data, um, Simone did touch on the seed to sale um, tracking systems. If that's cloud-based, you want to have cyber coverage on it. Um, touching back on the home delivery systems um, here in Massachusetts, the, the licenses that are being issued right now, a lot of them are set up like Grubhub and Uber Eats. So everything's online, cloud-based, and it's on an app on your phone connected to the internet. You want cyber. Um, a lot of people are uh, ordering right online on their laptops for dispensaries, pick up orders, you know, in the times of COVID, uh, door to door, you want cyber. Uh, that's something that a lot of these professionals on this uh, panel board are able to offer and talk about um, and something that you should really discuss with your broker as soon as you can, if you don't already have it in place. Um, the last piece that, you know, we're thinking about, um, you know, having our clients have after they get their license, sometimes even before they get their license is pieces of professional liability. You know, if you have investors in your business, you want to have directors and officers coverage. That's going to protect you as a director, an officer, or an executive making huge business decisions on behalf of your shareholders. Um, you really need to have something like that in place if you have uh, investors in your company. You know, it, within the cannabis space, um, not unfortunately, not everybody has a couple million dollars to spend getting their business up and running. So more than likely, there's going to be a couple groups of investors uh, getting you going. So. Um, something that you really need to think about getting even before you get your license. Um, the last piece that, uh, you know, I want to really touch on, it is in the professional liability realm, and it's errors and omissions insurance. Um, you know, a lot of the professional services and the members here on this panel, um, and some of you in the attendees uh, section, have errors and omissions insurance for your business. 
same thing applies to the cannabis industry. Um, you know, if a process and procedure is not followed um, and, you know, somebody screws up because there's human error, you know, this is where you're going to get covered for that. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, things do happen um, and losses happen because of, uh, you know, people aren't following the, the processes and pre procedures put forth by their company. Um, you want to have some errors and emissions insurance uh, included in your uh, insurance portfolio. So other than that, you know, those are a couple of the key pieces you want to have after you get your license um, and some of the pieces, like I said, before you get your license awarded to you in your respective state. Excellent. Thanks for that explanation. So I want to go back just a bit and talk a little more about cyber because it's really one of the newest coverages out there. And with everybody due to COVID working from home and most companies now being fully automated with some type of software program, can you delve into some of the issues that cyber defense, cybersecurity does cover? such as wire transfer fraud, such as ransomware. Kind of just give us a brief overview. Some of those things that we read about happen to other people, but may not have happened to us yet. Um, what's covered under cyber policy? Well, so that's uh, that's a good question, Eric. So a lot of the things that are uh, we hear about in the news when it comes to cyber exposure, cyber losses, you know, um, I know Target had a pretty big um, cyber loss uh, a couple of years back. A couple of the other huge corporations have had um, hacks into their business. Um, when it comes to cyber, um, it, it is a very new product, especially in this day and age of everybody being online at the, you know, at the same time, working from home. Um, so these types of policies are supposed to protect against those types of losses. Um, a good example would be, um, you know, if there's some sort of a ransomware that's uh, sent to an employee at a company through an email, the employee opens the email, ransomware gets into the company, it's only $100,000, you may think, you know, pay the ransom, be done with it, you get all of your access to your business back. The damages to that business is not just $100,000. You may have uh, damages upwards of $10 million at the end of the day because of actually financially reconstructing your business, getting all new computers, all new servers, all new cloud-based systems. Cyber policies are supposed to protect against these types of things after the fact, after a loss. One of the big things that we're doing and we're trying to do as an industry, and a lot of the folks on this panel are looking to do, is try and help folks on a pre-loss basis. Try and get things in place and advise our clients on things they can do to protect against these types of losses in this day and age of being online almost every single day for their entire workday and most of the time after their workday. Um, these are the types of things that you know cyber is, are supposed to protect against on the back end. All insurance policies are supposed to provide uh, coverage to recoup your business. Um, you know, one of the things that we need to do as an industry, especially with the cannabis industry, and cyber is a great example of this, is to help companies and advise them as insurance professionals and risk management professionals to avoid losses before they happen. Excellent answer. Thanks. Thank you. So we've now kind of come from the 3,000 foot view. Now we're going to get right, right down into the weeds and I'm going to talk to one of my favorite CPAs, Kevin Holler, and he's going to uh, talk about the long-term strategies of enterprise risk management and the real fundamentals that your company needs to really follow to be compliant. So, Kevin. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> um, my name is Kevin Haller of Akeen Consulting. Um, as Eric said, I'm a CPA in both California and Oregon. Um, you know, we've been serving the industry um, in a professional light since 2015. However, you know, my understanding and passion for this industry is in the 26 years now. Um, things I've seen in my career so far in the cannabis space is, you know, really, um, it's the gold rush of its time and everyone's running to uh, gobble up licenses and create opportunity. Um, one thing that has been neglected is that foundation that businesses need to be built upon, um, which is a system of internal control and enterprise risk management. And I like using the analogy of think of uh, construction, right? You're building a building. Internal controls are like mapping your blueprints and pouring the foundation. And a lot of what we've seen is 
business is going right to framing. The issue is, is it doesn't take very much to knock that entire structure down and it's not built to withstand time and change that will inevitably come in this industry as it's in its infancy stage. Um, so overall, all organizations need to set strategies and periodically adjust those strategies to stay ahead of both the ever-changing opportunities for creating value and the changes that will occur in the pursuit of that value. And, and one thing that was kind of uh, unique to cannabis and maybe just because it's such in its infancy stage is most industries, you do not see a business own the supply chain from start to finish. And we're seeing that in cannabis. And, and a lot of these businesses are gonna eventually need to pivot because you can't be great at all things. And you can look at Coca-Cola, McDonald's, or these giant businesses that they understand their place. And so, you know, businesses in, in this industry are going to need to evolve um, to stay uh, ahead of the curve. So overall, enterprise risk management is kind of the concept of, you know, proactively identifying and managing risks. And these are beyond risks that can be mitigated with insurance, which we've been kind of discussing. And some of the key benefits of developing and deploying an enterprise risk management uh, system in your company is, you know, the ability to respond to change, improve resource deployment, uh, increase positive outcomes while reducing negative surprises, uh, reduce performance variability, which is very relevant when you're a producer, right? You're growing cannabis, you need to know exactly um, what THC terpene levels that you're producing and consistently produce that. So there's a lot of challenges. And so really what, what we kind of come to is, is you got to be process focused, right? Everyone has their place in an organization success from governance. What are the strategies of governance? How does management, you know, bring those strategies to fruition? How do each individual employees contribute to the overall, you know, bigger picture? And so really it boils down to not only just, you know, documenting SOPs and filing them away and, you know, we've been there, done that, now we have them. You're going to be in more trouble having that than not creating a culture very focused on SOPs in terms of how those processes actually work. And the more you focus on really understanding all the different processes, the more you can look to opportunities to create efficiencies and automate those processes. You know, as a CPA, I'm always asked, what everyone wants to know is, you know, how do we get around 280E? And, and I, I, I basically would tell them, it's like, you don't while being compliant, right? The only way to get around 280E is for federal legalization or some sort of legal reform or decriminalization. Um, until that time, you don't want to, you know, create a marketing firm to offload your expenses, right? I see a lot of resources being deployed to circumvent 280E when you know, court cases have disproved that, right? It's all gonna be coming back into one. So what I always say when it comes to the 280E topic is optimize your top line and manage your costs. That's how you combat 280E. That's how you build a business that's gonna withstand time and understand how to pivot. And how to do that is, is by focusing on risks, processes, and mitigating risks. Um, you know, so it really it comes down to Keep it simple, stupid, right? You all, we all heard the KISS strategy. That's really what it is. Don't create unnecessary costs building something because 280E, right? I mean, the way this industry is moving, it's eventually going to be rescheduled, right? And I've seen tremendous amount of resources deployed um, that add no real value to the organization. And then, you know, even recently, a lot of those strategies are being unwound. Um, so, you know, we just being able to really know that this industry is going to evolve immensely and how do you understand and, and pivot and adapt to change. It's really having a mindset on focusing on um, risks and how to manage and mitigate those risks. Thanks, Kevin, for that explanation. So what happens, I open my doors, I get approved, in operation first six months I get a knock on the door state regulator wants to come in and do an audit what happens if I'm I don't have what I'm supposed to have well you you learn the hard way right you normally get fines and penalties I mean if you really think about this industry right it's it's legal right and I use the air quotes in case for 
those that didn't see, it's legal at certain state levels, it's illegal at a federal level. Because of that, you have banking regulations that you have to deal with. You have in managing money and keeping employees safe and secure. We have seed to sale that's just coming on that the regulators don't even really know how to monitor it, right? You have 280E and the non-compliance with 280E. If anyone saw the treasury report issued back in March of 2020, it was very obvious that majority of businesses are not following the 280E and you know, for example, California, uh, based on their sample, it would be $100,000 additional taxes in 2016 alone for non-compliance related to 280E. So businesses are going to learn the hard way through, you know, regulators coming in and looking at things. However, since this is new to the regulators, right, they're getting smarter too. We live in a day and age now where things are connected so much, right? The intent of seed to sale and, and how the IRS's ability to hone in on data it's only going to get more and more sophisticated. So I would say that we are kind of in the honeymoon stage of this industry right now, and it's going to get a lot harder on many before it gets better, right? I mean, when what does even federal legalization look like? Is it going to honor the state's licenses? Is it going to collapse? I've seen in certain jurisdictions where there was a lot of businesses, take the Bay Area, for example, Many of them collapsed and those regulators in that area condensed the industry. It's easier to oversee few. So it's kind of like Highlander, right? You wanna be one of the last heads standing as the industry goes through its evolution and pain points, you have to have the commitment to excellence and being compliant. Otherwise you're, you're only you know, trying to make short-term gains, right? And, and that might be the strategy, right? A lot of business people jumped into this industry not because they care about the industry, but because the opportunity to make a ton of money is huge. So they're building up businesses and gobbling up licenses and developing something that they want to sell and make their money. So you just have to understand, what is your strategy? Are you in it for the long haul, for the short haul? What's your strategy and how you're going to do it? So I would say to your question, Eric, it's like, that's how you learn, right? The regulators coming in. And what we mentioned on just the last topic before this is it's much cheaper to prevent issues than it is to put out fires, right? So using your money to smartly navigate your businesses instead of, well, we're gonna throw a bunch of money at attorneys and accountants to account for this new business we set up over here designed to house all of our marketing because we don't get it deducted under 280E. Well, guess what? If the same owners are there, I don't know how you're gonna paint the picture to the regulators that that's a standalone business and not part of your plant touching overall conglomerate. And so, just knowing that, again, bring it back to keep it simple. The rules are the rules. The better you navigate the rules, the more successful you will be as this industry grows and matures. Thank you. Eric, I wanted to, to jump in on the, the audit because I think just bringing it back to insurance, important to note as, as startups, we're obviously answering these applications forward thinking, and especially around security. The insurance companies will audit you and come check out your facility. So, you know, similar to your question, it's not the same as the state regulator coming in and, and giving you an audit. But if you answer in your insurance application, you have certain sec security features that are not there. Um, there's a good chance your insurance company will mandate them within a, a very short timeline or they'll cancel the policy. So I think it's important to make sure you're answering these things accurately and, and honestly. Because uh, as Kevin said, you will learn the hard way if you do not. So and important I, I'm going to address one of the questions I saw real quick, and it, it's kind of what is 280E? And I'll give a high level, right? 280 federal government back in the 80s, a cocaine dealer, right? He, he was filing his taxes. And in the end, what they determined in the courts is, is you get no deductions trafficking of a federal illegal substance. However, the cost of your cocaine, your cost of goods sold is actually a reduction in revenue and not a business deduction. So because cannabis is a schedule one substance, um, it, it has to follow 280E. So 280E, all you can deduct is your cost of goods sold. So producers have a lot more wiggle room, i.e. you know, cultivators and manufacturers. You can allocate a lot of your facility costs to the production of, of cannabis or other manufactured goods. Retail, however, roughly has an effective tax rate of 70% because your storefront 
is not inventory. It's not a deduction. Your bud tenders are not deduction. Your delivery drivers and vehicles are not deductions. The only thing you can deduct is the cannabis you buy and potential costs of packaging, depending on your state or how you're enhancing it. So um, really by design, that rule is intended to be incredibly harsh and, and many do not follow it, frankly. Um, and, and so it, it, it's, it's a big pain point and the IRS is upping their audits. We'll see a lot more. If we didn't have a pandemic, I believe this year would be um, a greater focus on that. But I think we bought a little extra time with this pandemic to delay what will in, be the inevitable, right? It's gonna be seed to sale that's gonna crush people and, and compliance as it pertains to 280E are gonna be very devastating blows. One last comment to add to that, especially uh, with the emerging uh, hemp CBD labeling of your products and conforming to your state regulations is probably the biggest thing that's gonna get you shut down the fastest need to follow your regulations when it comes to labeling. I think it's been a very informative and insightful seminar. I'm just going to go around the horn with last thoughts. Uh, anybody, uh, Jeff, want to chime in? Last thoughts for our, our, our panel here and uh, any closing remarks? Yeah, uh, I think somebody, uh, maybe Aaron Smith, the, the uh, director of NCA, asked, asked this question, but um, you know, the, the best way to get your, your state uh, insurance requirements is, is go to whether it's the Department of Health or they, you know, if they have a cannabis control commission, whoever is responsible um, to set those regulations in the state. So if you're a new applicant and you're applying and, and you're downloading the application from the, the state Department of Health website, the insurance requirements should be in there as well. So always check with the state. They're going to be the ones to, to tell you what is required. Uh, and I'm sure that will come up in your, your process to download and, and start filling out the applications. So I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, but I, I think great panel and, and thank, thank my peers and, and uh, everybody else for asking good questions and, and uh, appreciate you guys listening. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Matt, closing words? Yeah, uh, I know you guys talked about cyber insurance earlier uh, and gosh, I wish I had some to help my Zoom calls go a little bit more smoothly. Uh, did see one question in the chat from John uh, regarding cyber insurance and a quick answer on that is that typically yes, uh, those can be written monoline. In fact, and not a lot of the, the property and casualty cannabis insurance companies I'm aware of will write that coverage. Uh, but other than that, really enjoyed uh, working with you guys. I think we're going to answer some of the other questions offline and uh, hopefully I'll see you all again on another webinar in the uh, not too distant future. All right, Kevin. This industry will revolutionize the world when we look at recreational, medical and industrial applications of cannabis and hemp. It's an honor to be part of it and seeing how, where we're moving um, towards. It's also sad when we look at what has happened to lead to this point. I hope there's serious reform and I hope everyone who has a license takes it very serious. It's an honor and a privilege to be a part of this industry. So, you know, thank you for having me and uh, allowing me to be part of this panel today. Thank you. Michael, last parting words. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, it's been a, a pleasure to be on here and talk a little bit about what uh, needs to be done here in this industry when it comes to insurance. Insurance, as we all know, is not one of the most interesting topics, but I think between Simone's energy and the information provided by the rest of the panelists, uh, we made it a little bit interesting. So I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, looking forward to uh, being on another panel sometime soon and uh, go Tom Brady. That's all I got to say. And now to our coolest cat, Simone wrap us up. Well, definitely. I want to tell everybody, thank you so much for having me. This has been a wonderful honor to be a part of uh, this team and be a member of the NCIA. Again, I probably would say the biggest takeaway that every licensee or someone that's applying is understanding that your insurance package or risk management portfolio, it is a snowflake. There's not one that's going to be just like it. So if you have somebody that that's a friend who's been licensed and said, Oh, okay. Well, they just got this, this, this. No, it has to every industry, every business 
Every entity has unique risk and perils and hair, um, high hazards that need to be protected. And then last but not least, to piggyback on what Jeff says, whatever you do, be honest. Well, panelists, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it back over to Brian at the NCIA to wrap things up. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much. Like everyone has said, who knew uh, an insurance panel right in the middle of this week could be so engaging and entertaining. I know that I enjoyed today's panel more than maybe any of the other industry essentials we've done so far this year. So I really appreciate uh, everybody bringing their expert level knowledge uh, and all of their enthusiasm uh, for each of their uh, positions within the industry. Uh, it definitely is a privilege to be in this industry, Kevin, um, as you said. So I really appreciate all of you all uh, volunteering your hard, uh, uh, <clears throat> your time today to express uh, this fantastic information to all of our members and supporters across the country. Uh, as always, we're going to wrap today's session uh, by giving you all a quick preview of some upcoming events that are happening underneath of the NCIA Industry Essentials umbrella before letting you all go. So all of our panelists, you all can step off the virtual stage, stick around for the next few moments and interact with the audience members in the chat room as you all see fit. Um, as all of them have mentioned, uh, they would love for all of you all with, to follow up with any additional questions or personal outreach following today's program. Uh, we will share a PDF of today's uh, slide, which our slideshow, which does have all of their contact information embedded within it. Feel free to use the next few moments to solicit that information from any of the panelists directly via DM in the chat room, though. Um, and uh, feel free to follow up with them post session. Like, uh, <clears throat> like Kevin did mention, um, any open questions that are still in the Q&A board, we'll field those among the panel um, post session and we will make sure to include responses to those in our uh, public webinar recording um, on our blog. So make sure to stay on the lookout for that uh, being posted over the next few days. All right, and first off, so uh, we usually have individual slides with some preview text for each of these upcoming sessions, but we have so many upcoming programs that we had to condense everything down into one slide. So as all of you all can see, we have eight upcoming Industry Essentials webinars with more to be plugged in between this time span uh, over the next month and a half. So please, if you are an NCIA member, make sure to log on to NCIA's website, redeem all of your free tickets for those upcoming events, which comes to over $75. And if you are not an NCIA member, do note that that $75 lines up pretty well with one month of a, a basic level membership. So do please consider joining so that you'll get uh, complimentary access to all of these upcoming sessions underneath of our Industry Essentials program and all of the countless sessions that are going to be scheduled between now and the rest of the year. Uh, for that specific session that's taking place on, when is it, February 24th? movement on interstate commerce. I know a lot of people had questions regarding uh, where federal reform is. That uh, session is part of our monthly fireside chats with NCIA's government relations team. Those sessions are exclusive to NCIA members. So if you are looking for the most up-to-date uh, <clears throat> up knowledge on where federal reform stands, you do not want to miss our monthly members-only uh, conversations with our government relations team. Uh, they are the team that's lobbying each and every day, even during the pandemic, on your behalf for the industry. And uh, as a few of the panelists mentioned, we are at a tipping point right now um, with the new Congress uh, that's coming in. We've never been closer to actually actually getting some of our key reforms um, uh, moved on. So please do um, consider joining so that you can access that uh, exclusive members only session at the end of the month. All right, and with that, thank you all so much for participating in another NCIA Industry Essentials educational webinar. A huge thank you once again to all of our panelists, our audience members and member businesses, which make our work e possible each and every day. Uh, you'll all be directed to an attendee survey following this meeting room closing, so please do complete that. That will grant you immediate access to our presentation. And like I mentioned, do note that all NCIA members receive exclusive 30-day access to a formatted video recording of all of our webinars, first posted in our members-only community platform, NCIA Connect. So if you're one of the NCIA members in attendance today, stay on the lookout for a library posting to be put up inside the Industry Essentials webinar community later today or early tomorrow morning with the recap from today's session. 
All right. I hope you all have a wonderful week and I look forward to seeing you all again next time for another NCIA Industry Essentials educational webinar of which two are taking place next week on the 16th and the 17th. So we'll leave you all as always with this end of event credit sequence highlighting the over two dozen member businesses that participated in today's session. As always, while doing so, we'll showcase some audio stylings by the resident musician at our Colorado-based in-person events, KJ Liss, and his Illinois-based musical side project, Indigo Sun. Enjoy, and we'll see you all later next week.